Thank you all for being here today. And we're going to give you a presentation on Common Core. With all the big government overreach going on in our country today, this is one aspect that the vast majority of Americans know nothing about. Somebody did a recent survey about Obamacare and found that about 44% of Americans didn't, either didn't realize it had been implemented or thought it had been overturned already. So almost half the country, after all these years with Obamacare, don't even realize it. The people who recognize what Common Core is, it's in single digits across the country. So we're going to start with a little explanation of what it is and try to expose you to some of the dangers of it. Mary's going to lead us off with a brief overview of what Common Core is and how it got started. Common Core is a set of nationalized standards that was developed by the National Governors Association and Council of Chief School State Officers. It was done more or less behind closed doors in conjunction with Arne Duncan and the Department of Education. The goal is to have every school in America teaching the same thing every day at the same time. The standards themselves are written in a manner that will teach children what to think, not how to think. The National Governors Association and Council of Chief State School Officers formed a foundation, private foundation, Achieve Incorporated, and it was those private trade organizations that wrote the the Common Core Standards. The um, writer of the English language arts, we'll discuss him more uh, in depth later, was actual, is actually a businessman. Never had any teaching. This is what the standards, this is what the standards are, and we're going to, to go deeper because I firmly believe that truly there is more to this than just the standards themselves. An interesting fact too is, as you can see up there, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, very liberal activist group, spent about $150 million to finance these, and let's call them what they are, they're lobbyists. These groups that put this together, they're not educators, they're not teachers, they're not people with degrees or experience in education. These are lobbyists who put this together with a large pool of money, about $150 million from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And the really alarming thing about where Common Core got started, that uh, so bad has the previous legislation on education been. No child left behind has been a screeching disaster. We all know that uh, President Bush let uh, uber-liberal Teddy Kennedy write the education bill, which has been such a disaster. And so uh, states have been suffering under these poorly performing schools. This particular uh, educational paradigm we've been laboring under has been a failure. So what the Obama administration did to get states to sign on to Common Core, years before Common Core was even written, before these standards were written, under the guise of Race to the Top program, some of you have made to her, may have heard of that, the Race to the Top program, the federal government promised every state in the union tens of millions of dollars of taxpayer money to help out struggling education budgets. The only proviso being, we'll give you the money now, but in two or three years, you have to accept Common Core standards sight unseen. Interesting tidbit, Georgia last week, after looking at the Common Core standards, rejected them. The federal government today decided they are pulling millions of dollars out of Georgia to punish them for doing so. All right, that's how we got here. 46 states in the union, including Wisconsin, where we are, 46 states in the union signed up, took the money under this deal that they would take Common Core when it came, no questions asked. And that's where we are now. And not only did the government try to s snare the states into accepting Common Core with the trap of, of no race, of race to the top money, they also offered a waiver to No Child Left Behind. Anybody who was teaching in that time can uh, relate to the state's eagerness to get that monkey off their back. It was a disaster. So if just by signing, a, signing on to Common Core, they got a waiver. They didn't have to uh, keep uh, in step with uh, No Child Left Behind. This actually began with the Elementary and Secondary Education Act in 1965 with uh, President Lyndon Johnson. 
And this interesting thing about the waivers, one of the things you're going to see as we move forward in our presentation is just how the synchronicity between Obamacare and Common Core. You are all familiar with the waivers, right? Even before the legislation on Obamacare had passed, they were doling out uh, waivers to big donors. They were do doling out waivers to all sorts of private interest groups. Same thing is happening here with the previous educational uh, regime being transferred now into Common Core. And so you'll see a lot of those parallels moving forward. What we have here is a slide. Mary I'll talk a little bit about it. One of the things that you'll hear, uh, the defenders of Common Core, the people, teachers unions people, people who are close to the administration, will always poo-poo what we're talking about. They'll always dismiss this by arguing Common Core is nothing but a framework. It's just a framework of guidelines. Students will have autonomy. Well, this is a pretty shocking thing we pulled right from the literature. Want to talk about this, Mary? Yes. This is a public license. It's available on the internet. And it states clearly that the copyright is owned by the National Governors Association and the Council of Chief State School Officers. And it says that um, the sole owners and developers, meaning the only ones, once Common Core is adopted, the only ones who can change anything about it are those two organizations. Curiously, in all the hours of research that has been put into this, there is just a very limited list of those people and those organizations. So the parents, there's a problem at school. Well, the school's going to say, so sorry, you have to go to Washington and talk to, find out who these people are and talk with them. Think about the autonomy parents have had. You've seen all these stories in the news about kids being suspended for having NRA t-shirts and how effective moms and dads and communities have been going to their local school boards, going to the local principals, going to their state governments and getting this nonsense overturned and set right again. Well now all that's going to go away. And the funny thing about this is it's really frightening is that the NGA and the CCSO these are incredibly small organizations that have no formal educational background, as we've said. They're the ones now who dictate copyrighted material. And in all the schools from kindergarten through high school, all the public schools across the land, you will not be able to deviate from Common Core curriculum. You may be able to add certain things here and there, but you are not allowed to deviate or neglect Common Core standards. So even if you try to supplement this a little bit, you're still going to have to teach the entire framework of Common Core every day in the classrooms. What threats does Common Core pose? And this was what I alluded to at the beginning. Both Dr. Besta and I agree that this is the most onerous part of Common Core, are the threats, not just the standards themselves. We're talking about threats that come along. The first one is the complete federal control of education and the loss of state and local authority over our students. This one-size-fits-all model, we see how bad that's going to be for, for uh, health care, right? That there's no uh, ability to distinguish regional differences, um, tropical uh, climate differences in terms of where people live, agricultural differences, none of these things that affect health and welfare and well-being. It's a one-size-fits-all uh, marketplace, if you can even call it a marketplace. It's really a forced top-down system. And one of the great problems here is, is that all different school districts have different needs. Some school districts are going to have more at-risk students. Some school districts are going to have more single-parent uh, families. Some school districts are going to be much better off than others. But this one-size approach, all that's going to do, as it always does in situations like this, is gravitate to the, to the lowest common denominator. This educational paradigm, its entire premise, it's going to improve statistically education simply because the standards have so been lowered, it's almost impossible, if you go through the, this federal program, it's almost impossible not to meet the standards because they are utterly lacking in ambition and they are utterly lacking in achievement. The bar has been set so low that it's almost impossible to meet these standards. And statistically, what that's going to mean is, look at how successful this is. Everyone is doing well in our new curriculum. Uh, the important thing to know is that many proponents of Common Core will say, well, these are just standards. We're not touching curriculum. But I have this week uh, studied the actual teacher's manuals, and it is very utterly clear that the standards are right there in the teacher's manual directing everything the teacher says and does. 
you've got lawyers, high, the highest ranking lawyers in the Department of Education, including Robert Eitel and Kent D. Talbert, counsel and general counsel, respectively, of the Department of Education, who made the following observation about Common Core and its legality. In imposing the Common Core standards and aligned assessment on the states, the federal government is violating three statutes and has put America on the road to a nationalized curriculum. With respect to the race to the top slash common core scheme, Robert Eitel and Kent D. Talbert, former deputy general counsel and general counsel respectively of the US Department of Education concluded that quote, these standards and assessments will ultimately direct the course of elementary and secondary study in most states across the nation, running the risk that states will become little more than administrative agents for a nationalized K-12 program of instruction and raising a fundamental question about whether the department is exceeding its statutory boundaries. These, these are the Department of Education lawyers. The race to the top application, the initial vehicle through which Common Core was imposed, we mentioned that earlier, it requires applicants to adopt, quote, a set of content standards that are substantially identical across all states in the, consor in the consortium. So this means that states must adopt Common Core word for word. This is the copyright we mentioned before. This notion, so many of our teachers are utterly deluded about this. So many of our uh, superintendents and supervisors of schools are convinced, it's the same thing they told you about Obamacare, right? Obamacare was going to be this very flexible, once it was implemented and we had this common baseline, it was gonna be very flexible, you can keep your own doctor, you remember that, right? And now you've got the very Democratic architects of, even the Democrat architects in the Congress and Senate of Obamacare are calling it an unwieldy train wreck. Right? This is the same path we're headed for here. And I, I have concluded um, a long while ago that the teachers and principals are being given some latitude right now with Common Core for the purpose of selling it and convincing them, oh yes, nothing's really changed. It, it's very clear from discussions with teachers on the two coasts, New York and California, that most of the country hasn't even felt the iron grasp of Common Core, but it's real and it will be, it is a threat. It's incrementalism, isn't it? That's the way all fascist states of whatever stripe operate. It's that slow, gradual creep, isn't it? Get them used to this. It's the old uh, frog in the boiling pot of water metaphor. You know that, right? You dump a frog in a pot of water, turn the boiler on low, frog does it gradually, it never feels it getting hotter until it gets so hot that the frog is cooked in its own juices. Um, one of the things that we've already alluded to that is pretty insidious about this is the absolute intermeshing with the enforcement of Obamacare. How your children in schools from kindergarten all the way through high school are going to become absolute, for lack of a better word, lab rats for uh, Obamacare. They're gonna start mapping kids at the earliest ages. You'll see a little bit later some of the actual knowledge that the federal government will be collecting via, among other agencies, Obamacare on your kids as they sit in public schools. This is actually a um, show, uh, we show here the Obamacare document and note that it uh, under the small letter B, it says the requirement for all states to assess statewide needs and identity at risk communities. It lists premature poverty, premature birth, poverty, crime, domestic violence, high rates of high school dropout, substance abuse, unemployment, child maltreatment. These are all doors that can be used for school officials to get into the homes of homeschool students. It, it's very likely this is how they're going to, to reach all students. Under this huge umbrella of mental health care, sexual health care, social health care, physical health care, abuse health care, anti-bullying statutes, right? All this stuff now under this huge umbrella allows the federal government to intervene. Schools will collect this data on a state. The states become agents, right? They go from being independent voices in how districts and school uh, groups in their state will operate. They become little more than ciphers, whose job it is to enforce both the activities of Obamacare in what we'll see in a few minutes, data mining on, biometric data mining on your students, Right? Uh, everything from pulse rate and facial expression, blood pressure as they sit in the seats. Not every student is going to be monitored every day. 
but they will be. In fact, they're already being tested. We'll tell some anecdotes from places like New York of kids already coming home having been uh, invasively measured and monitored in their schools. But the tie-ins to Obamacare, and if you get a chance to look more at the statute, we can only give you a snippet here in what we've given you, but ev almost every aspect of your kid's life is completely subsumed under the parameter of health. And the schools now spend more time attending to what health is than teaching lessons. And so schools now become primarily, and, and we knew this was coming, P many commentators have remarked about this, that once the government controls health care, then everything you do affects the bottom line, doesn't it? Every breath you take, methane or, or every breath you take, every, you, the amount of sleep you do or don't get, where you drive, when you drive, and in particular, the next generation. And you see why this is a perfect Trojan horse. You're going to hear that word from us a lot. Common Core is a Trojan horse for the implementation of all these super far-ranging big government penumbras to cover every aspect of human existence. You get a chance to see all the things that are covered there. Right? If you, when, by the time we're done, I think you'll recognize that there's very little left for parents to do. There is very little left that becomes the, pro in fact, nothing becomes the province of the parent. You don't have a right to teach your kids what you want to teach them about homosexuality. Because if you teach them the wrong thing, that qualifies under anti-bullying legislation. And you'll see that in a moment, too. So these tie-ins are absolutely shocking. Let's talk about data mining and intrusive record keeping. This is an area where I think uh, the government, the schools, are definitely soft-pedaling it until they know that this Common Core is, is solidly in place. But they're prepared for it. If you go back and uh, research, even as early as Race to the Top, uh, in the executive summary of Race to the Top, you will see that it is mandated that states to get race to get the money for signing on to Common Core have to build a data mining storage. Multi-billion dollar facilities like this are growing up all over the Southwest. States will be responsible for overseeing the data mining of, and the record keeping of every single student in the schools. And it's, of course, it's, like everything else, this is bigger than just the schools. But these specific buildings are being built to house billion dollar uh, operations to house, to house these huge sweeping electronic records on your kids. Think about this for a second. Remember when we were kids and you'd be in grade school or elementary school, you'd have a bad day? You'd fail a quiz or you'd blow off a test. And, and that, by the end of the semester, you'd righted, righted the ship and you got the grade you got. Now, every assignment, every grade you get, every warning you get from a teacher or every disciplinary episode, being, staying after class and clapping erasers or being sent to the right. principal's office, this becomes part of your permanent file and will be with you for the rest of your life. And it can be accessed by uh, uh, law enforcement, can be accessed by job creators, by, if you go to apply for a job. Something that you, your kid did in sixth grade, theoretically, will be at the fingertips of employers moving forward. This kind of huge database system on all of us. It's, again, this is a bigger problem, and these facilities are built for more than just Common Core. But one of the key aspects of where Common Core and uh, Obamacare overlap is the keeping of the, and the NSA, keeping of these records on every aspect of human behavior. Right? When a state... Um, signs on to Common Core, they have their choice of belonging to two different test consortia. There is the Smarter Balance and then there is PARC. I have learned that those, when a state signs on with one of them, that the state gives the test consortia total right to any information that they put in this database and the, and the uh, agreement is in the test consortia, then must report everything to the federal government. It's a direct pipeline. And the IRS, too, of course, of necessity, does a lot of this information gathering. And so, as we now know, that I, the IRS and Obamacare are inextricably linked. 116,000 new IRS agents hired over the last few years, all to keep track of your health care. Because your health care now is a taxable item, isn't it? Well, it's free, but you have to be paying your taxes to cover the so-called free health care. 
And so all that data mining, right, all this ties in here. All these different areas of government overreach, for, it's almost like an octopus just suffocating the life out of you. From kindergarten up, one of those big tentacles comes across. And in all these different ways, it all contributes. And, and the, the thing that's so insidious about this is we've learned, we've known from history, we've known how these types of uh, big government implementation programs always work. It just takes one, gen one new generation of kids. If you can just start with one new generation of kids from the earliest ages. The president was again on the news the other day talking about how it's time he's pivoting once again to the economy. And it's all about mandatory pre-K now, right? That's what he wants. Every American kid should have, has the right to be in school at age five's not early enough. Get him in at age four now, right? And they want him even younger. Yeah, I know they're talking about going younger than that too, right? It's, it's, and uh, under the guise of universal rights, but the sooner government gets them into these systems, the sooner they get them out of your hands and into the classroom, the sooner all this really invasive, and we'll see some shocking things now, but the sooner all this really invasive stuff. And when your kids are young and in the home with you, there is very little the government as of yet can do to come into your home and mess with them. But once they get them into the public schools, and they determine that your kid is unhappy or his blood pressure gets really high when he hears something he doesn't like to hear or his facial response isn't what it should be based on the information he's getting All, or he, your kid's a little overweight or underweight for those very rigid guidelines of what your weight and height are supposed to be, then that now invites the opportunity for both school intervention and then government intervention. This is a paper that is uh, almost impossible now to get off the internet. We have actually had to make a hard copy and, and preserve it as a PDF. This is promoting grit, tri uh, grit, tenacity, and perseverance. It is written by the Department of Education. As you can see, it was published in February of 2013. Please note that the Department of Education was very much linked with the National Governors Association the, uh, and the Council of Chief State School Officers. Uh, Arne Duncan was, was involved very closely with this. So there is little reason to believe that this isn't going to become a part of Obama, I mean, Common Core. And one thing that's really interesting about this, if you even think about the title of this, uh, one of the things that's happened here, as with Obamacare, when Obamacare was first being brooded about back in 2008, early 2009, there were all sorts of documents about its implementation that were online and available. And all this uh, propaganda was coming out about how wonderful it was going to be and how uh, everybody was going to be able to have everything they have now and not have to pay for it. And as people started to challenge this, one by one, these public documents, government documents, started disappearing from the Internet. As people started to put, the initial response was, let's throw this out there as this utopian vision and wait to see what happens. And initially, people were excited about it, and then people started to read the details. And then phase two, let's pull it off, let's scrub it from the internet now. Get rid of it so that no one can see these documents. And then when everybody, anybody tries to raise the points, you can't find them. This is one of those documents. We're not the only one who has it. A lot of people made copies of this before they got rid of it. Interesting, you try to find this on the internet now. This is a Department of Education document from February of this year, you won't find it. And we'll show you why, momentarily, why you won't find this anymore. But just look at the words of the title, promoting grit, tenacity, and perseverance. That's what we want in education, right? This is, even the, 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 uh, the, the word choice here, it's not achievement, it's not, it's not proficiency, it's not achievement, it's not accomplishment, it's not excellence. We just want them hanging in there, right? It's a grind, right? Uh, and it's no wonder when you see what we're about to show you why this is no longer able to be found. This is why it can no longer be found. From the same document. This is in... Um promoting grit, tenacity, and perseverance. These are effective sensors that the Department of Education has developed and plans to use. That's what this document is all about, is how do we measure the students effectively? There, there is a facial expression camera. There is a posture analysis seat. There is a pressure mouse. And there is a wireless skin conductance sensor. I was involved with a group of activists who were fighting Common Core 
Um, we have a conference call weekly. And one of the participants discussed a, a child, a young child, who had actually had a wireless skin conductance sensor put on her wrist, and it had been put on so tight that she came home with red, a red swollen wrist. So although they're hiding this, um, they don't want it to be known, obviously, but the plans are, are solid. They're in the document. Uh, you can go to our website. We have it preserved there. And if you think about what's happening here, one of the things that's going to happen in the Common Core curriculum is your kids will stop using books, they'll be given computers, they'll be given laptops. This is already happening in a number of school districts in, districts in Wisconsin. It's one school district in Wisconsin now that the only requirement for incoming college or incoming high school freshmen, no books, no pencils, just a laptop computer, which you had to buy from them that the government sold you. And these will be equipped increasingly with these, these effective, AFF, not, e, not how effective they are, but the effects, how, what they're learning, what their facial expressions are, these posture seats, almost like mini, look like little mini electrical chairs, electric chairs, right? That they're gonna be uh, measured for how they're sitting and what their posture's like, these pressure mounts. So, if, so give you an example of, of, a down and dirty example of how this can be used. One of the things that you'll find here as part of this umbrella of health is anti-bullying legislature with regard to the Department of Edu uh, Education and Common Core in particular. What mom and dad doesn't want their kids to be free of bullying? It's become such a hot button issue, right, um, that n no one in their right mind would think about fighting that. Unless, classic example, by, we'll see in a few slides that the federal government's going to be t mainstreaming, among other things, homosexuality to kids as young as kindergarten. Some of the requirements for kindergarten, first, and second graders are going to be to explain how sexual attraction crosses genders. As young as second grade, they're going to have to do this. We'll show you the slides in a minute. And under the guise of anti-bullying legislation, if the government is teaching a, a lesson, or the government teacher is teaching a lesson about homosexual relationships, homosexual marriage, uh, and your kid makes a face, or your kid slouches in her seat, or your, the pressure on your kid's mouse intensifies, right? Or blood pressure and pulse go skyrocketing. Well, then, it's good, fair to reason that your kid has the wrong attitude about homosexuality. Somewhere that kid is being taught to be a bully. And if your kid learned from you, mom and dad, that your faith tells you that homosexuality is wrong, then you're the bullies. You're the ones who are abusing that kid. These are the kind of things that these things will measure. There's no other reason for it. Right? And all this was online. They were, in fact, they were actually bragging about this in that Department of Education manual until people saw it and freaked out. And now it's gone off the web. But we're not the only ones who have it. We'll give you all the, and, and any information you want from us, you contact us, we'll give you copies of all of this too. And there are more things besides that one mother from New York City, yes? Yes, a, there is a, a mother whom I've been in contact with on a very regular basis, had an instance where her, her son was, was having some definite problems with in the school classroom after they changed to Common Core and it included meltdowns in the school lobby. He's a little third grader. And then um, it progressed to him locking himself in the car. And they, to resolve this issue, they sent four school adults, four school authorities, out to, to get him out of the car. Not uh, any parent will know that that's not the way you deal with the situation like that. The mother stood back, hoping that the school people could handle the situation nicely, and the vice principal grabbed the child, or was going to grab the child, this little boy, by his ankles to take him into school that way. And we should point out something that we haven't made clear yet. Aspects of Common Core are already in the schools. In the state of Wisconsin, the English uh, language uh, uh, Common Core has already gone so far in Wisconsin schools that when a lot of this was brought to the attention of some state legislators, they tried to postpone it 
to have hearings on. They're supposed to have hearings. over Four sets of hearings are supposed to occur in Wisconsin over the next three months. They promised us these hearings six months ago. We've heard nothing about them. But four or five months ago, when a series of people, both in state and out of state, protested in Wisconsin, a, a number of state legislators tried to put the kibosh on this, at least until they themselves. Because it's stunning how many uh, congressmen, how many senators. I I'm not convinced Governor Walker even knows the extent of what's going on with Common Core. We, the number of, of, of elected politicians we've talked to, they, they, you know much more now than they do because this has been so hush-hush. All we know at a state level is we received millions of dollars of money that we wouldn't have had otherwise three or four years ago. And all it took was to sign on to these Common Core standards. Right? So bringing this all to the attention is really critical. But in these, it, it, when these legislators got together to try to look in to see if this was really true, they did find out found out enough that would really shock them. So they tried to temporarily put them on hold. Turns out that the English standards were so far advanced in Wisconsin schools already that they couldn't stop them. They put the math on hold, but they could not put on hold the English, which is absolutely traveling apace right now in Wisconsin schools. And how many people in the state, how many uh, 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 parents in the state of Wisconsin do you think have any idea that it's already there? The most glaring example of this would be the C-Scope program in Texas. C-Scope. Now, Texas is one of those, one of the 46 states in the Union took it. Texas was one that didn't. Texas was very suspicious of this. Texas was very vigilant about, as you know, about this big government intrusion. Unbeknownst to the state legislature of Texas, the, the school board unions and the teachers unions had begun implementing this curriculum called, and you can look this up, called C-Scope. Very similar to Common Core, C-Scope, right? And so what it was was, a prototype of Common Core. The assignments and the requirements of this program were so outrageous that within about a year, parents all across the state of Texas were complaining about it. Among other things, 12-year-old girls were required to come to class in Texas dressed as Muslim girls, covered in burqas, covered in everything but the eyes, for Muslim Awareness Day. They, by the way, they did not have a corresponding Christian Awareness Day. They, one of the assignments for third graders was to draw, imagine a new communist country and draw its flag. And we have images of that too, of, of kids going home and drawing little communist flags with hammers and sickles in their public schools. Well, a couple, about a, two months ago, this became exposed in Texas. And the Texas legislature about a month ago came out and said, as of September of this year, C-Scope will be completely gone from our school system. Already the insidious nature of what was going on with C-Scope. This has been going on for, Mary mentioned that this all got started. This federalization movement really got started back in 65 with LBJ, yeah. right, the Great Society. And it's come and it's gone and it's gone and it's, it's moved forward and it's taken steps back. This is a very big, big, this is in some ways a default blow. Once this happens, it's going to be hard to undo it. And I think it should be noted right here and now that the authors, the architects, if you will, of C-Scope were none other than Bill Ayers and Linda Darling Hammond. I encourage you to look them up and you will you find know who out Bill Ayers what is, kind right? of... People. The unrepentant uh, world, uh, bomber, uh, bomber from the 60s, the Weather Underground, who allegedly Obama started his campaign in his front room, and he claims to have been the ghostwriter of Obama's two biographies. Right, this is the guy who, after unabashedly trying to bomb the Pentagon, getting away with, and not really having to really suffer for it, became, not surprisingly, a highly respected college professor. He's now retired, giving $100,000 lectures all across the country, all across the world, really, about the implementation of socialism in the modern classroom. He was one of the chief architects of C-Scope. Um, and we're not even, we could go beyond this. We haven't even gotten into iris scanning yet, which is already starting in some schools. Taking uh, the, the, you think fingerprints or something, iris scanning is, be, there's already talk about that being implemented in schools. And there is even talk about a mandatory MRIs. Yes, it's called an fMRI, mm -hmm. functional MRI. It's similar but not exactly the same as an MRI that you might get for medical treatment. The fMRI takes, actually takes a map of your brain. It can determine what you're thinking, if you're anxious, if you're angry, if you're happy, content strips students of every last ounce of privacy. Now the response to this is going to be, well, I don't see this online. The response to this is going to be, well, you're exaggerating. It's the whole, you got to pass it to see what's in it thing, right? 
that everything that's attached to this, all the way that, that these things fit together. I mean, how many times can you let yourself be fooled that way? Right? It, this kind of stuff was, they were actually bragging about this in the grit, tenacity, and perseverance document. The information on IRA scanning was just, in, the reason we don't even have it up yet, because that's just hit the news over the last couple weeks about how IRA scanning is already going on in certain schools. So go a little bit further here. The Trojan horse for outside interest groups, including Planned Parenthood, the National Sexuality Education Standards, and the United Nations, specifically Agenda 21. I'd like to uh, start with Agenda 21. Bill Gates has funded, as we said earlier, over $100 million for the uh, Common Core Standards. There, are, there is a document that shows that he was aligned with UNESCO's, that's a, a subsidiary of, of the UN, their education arm, the United Nations Educational and Scientific Cultural Organization. UNESCO developed education for all. Bill Gates was a participant in this, partnered with them. If you look carefully, you will see a great deal of similarity between the UN's Education for All and Common Core. The purpose of this, it, it, it is easily concluded, is that to implement Agenda 21, because it is so radical, children have to be educated and taught to believe in this and taught to think that way. So there is a tie, a definite tie, between Common Core and Agenda 21. We just give a brief overview of what Agenda 20 is broadly. Agenda 21 is uh, a plan to preserve the environment, but its purpose is similar to uh, Common Core. It's control. Control of how much, how far you can drive, the kind of gasoline you can use, the way that you use your own property. The size of your house. Yes. The number of pets you can have. Yes. And one of the interesting things about this is that if you look at the C-Scope program, which is a clear forerunner of Common Core, Bill Ayers is involved in it, tied to UNESCO, right, the United Nations uh, uh, global education paradigm, which is systematically designed to elevate non-Western countries while stagnating Western developed ones. One of the interesting things is if you look at the curriculum C-Scope, do you know who wrote some of the social studies le lectures that were taught in Texas schools? La Raza, the radical separatist Hispanic or Mexican organization. La Raza, it means the race. It's a very radical separatist group who believes that Arizona, California, New Mexico, they all belong to Mexico, they should be given back to Mexico immediately. Right? that our kids in third and fourth and fifth grade social studies in Texas were reading about how Americans stole those places, they didn't belong to us, that, that the objective needs to be to give them back. There will be no social justice until that's given back. This was in the actual curriculum. Right? La Raza is a violent separatist organization. It, it, some, some government organizations even have them labeled a terrorist group. But their curriculum was what was being read in social studies classes under C-Scope. This is right out of UN. This is UNESCO's written all over it. The, uh, besides uh, uh, the United Nations, Planned Parenthood is in charge of much of the literature about sexual education that will be in the schools. Right? They're already writing books and targeting kids as young in three and four and five, not just about gender and sexual identity, but about sexuality. One book I looked at specifically, actually saw the book, uh, had very graphic childhood cartoon drawings teaching children as young as second graders how to masturbate. Graphic illustrations of naked children doing that to themselves. And they were geared for second and third graders to begin to the classrooms to show kids. And the argument is, is that if kids learn how to do that behavior, they'll be less likely to experiment with sex with others. That's the argument. And it's not just Planned Parenthood. What we'll go to the next slide, the National Sexuality Education Standards. If everyone, take every one person in this country who's heard of Common Core, divide them into 10. That percentage may have heard of the National Sexuality Education Standards. These are how your kids under the umbrella of Common Core and Obamacare are going to be taught sexuality in the schools. It's already happening. 
and we want to show you the cover so that if there's any doubt in your mind that these are real, that people have taken the time, those who want to push this, have taken the time to carefully lay out the plan. Um, it, we have learned that indeed Planned Parenthood contacted, worked with the authors of Common Core when developing this. Look at the, are you starting to see a pattern here? How much time are the schools spending on this stuff? Over and over again. What are the, you understand a little bit now why the actual subject matter doesn't matter anymore? One of the great outrages about Common Core is how it dumbs down, trivializes, utterly subordinates math skills, reading skills, historical knowledge, all that goes by the wayside. And you get all these social, uh, soci social cultural building exercises. Look at the language here. Core sex standards? What does that even mean? Sexuality standards, co core content and skills. Is that what you're sending your kids to learn? Sex skills? And, and it may sound like a quibble here, but the language really does mean something. That they are not taking a neutral aspect to sexuality. They, we've gone from a don't ask, don't tell policy o over the years, right? To, to a absolute specific agenda that is going to be tied into almost every aspect of what your kids are learning. We already mentioned the, the effective measurements. We've already mentioned the bullying legislation. We're gonna show you some of the specific guidelines now this outlines, this um, is at the, the beginning of the document, and I urge you to take time, find it on the internet yourself. You won't believe what you're seeing. This is, uh, these are some of the standards that they have, have set um, for the um, achievement of, I guess, uh, sex education. Well, but look at one thing very interesting. They don't use the word sex. We're back to Obamacare. What year word do they use? Health. Health. Every one of these concepts, common core concepts, right? Standard one, students will comprehend at the earliest levels, the first beginnings, right? Concepts related to health promotion and disease prevention to enhance health, right? Teaching, actively teaching and demonstrating masturbation to children is a health issue. By teaching them that, they're much, because we know, we know, right? That second graders are gonna be sexually active no matter what we do, we know that, right? That's the standard. And so consequently, knowing that, our job is not to try to teach any kind of morality, not to try to teach any kind of values, not to try to teach, teach any self-respect or self-worth to kids to convey those issues. Our object now is to, under the guise of health, encourage what we know is gonna happen anyway, right? And so it's all health. Comprehend concepts related to health promotion and disease prevention. What does that mean to a second grader? What does it mean to a first grader? How about standard number six? Students will demonstrate the ability to use goal setting skills to enhance health. That is, is so far out that who really understands what it is they're trying to accomplish? And these are sexuality standards, right? The blurring of, of, the, of health and wellness and what you've got going on here. And I, I don't want to be too dramatic, but if you think about what happened in Nazi Germany, and you think about how the schools became places for training soldiers. They became places where sound mind, sound body, and the Nazi regime did something very similar in that it promoted very early, very intensive sex education because the Wehrmacht needed soldiers. And they needed young girls to have a healthy attitude towards sex and to reproduction so that you could keep churning out future generations of soldiers. Right? And I, I realize that it's, if, if anybody watching this video can take a, that little clip out and, ah, see, that's what they are. They're just fanatics. But I'm telling you, the, one of the first things the Nazis did when they took over in, in, in Germany in the 1930s was to institute universal health care. One, one of the first things they did was to collect all the guns, mandatory gun control. And then we know, we know about the Hitler Jugend. We know about the schools. We know about how the schools were completely nationalized and how under the guise of building a stronger Germany, a healthier Germany, a more responsible Germany, what happened? All, right, all the physical education standards, all the sexuality standards, all the high, under the guise of hygiene, right? they all got codified and tied into this. This is at the end of the second grade. They're grouped into uh, three-year sections. This is for grade kindergarten through second grade. 
By the end of second grade, students should be able to identify different kinds of family structures, should demonstrate ways to show respect for different types of families. Now, if you happen to be a God-fearing Christian parent and have taught your children that a marriage is between a man and a woman and a very sacred thing, what do you think your child is going to do when taught this, and remember, they're going to be monitoring this. Well, it raises another question, too. It's not just a Christian issue. What happens when Islamic kids are taught in first and second grade in our public schools to value non-traditional family structures, to be able to identify them, to be able to ar make arguments on the behalf of non-traditional families? What happens then? That's going to be an interesting little experiment in mind control, too. I mean, you just have a whole lot of clashes coming here. Um, and some of these things are, we can go a little bit further here. Some of these are pretty shocking when you think about them. Um, under the guise, and again, the way they phrase this, these, we're still in the sexuality standards, by the way. Uh, explain, why, explain why bullying and teasing are wrong. Well, who defines what those things mean? The, the, the nice thing about this is they use these buzzwords that, no, no, in all honesty, I'll tell you, I would rather have my kid punched in the nose every day and his lunch money taken by one bully than to have the full force of the federal government in, in, in sort of coming down in this very restrictive way of who's really, if you want to talk about what bullying is, you want to talk, you're not allowed, your moms and dads aren't allowed to teach their kids what they think sexuality is and isn't. Moms and dads no longer are allowed to determine the rightness and wrongness of certain sexual activities. And if you don't conform, right, then what happens? Your kid shows up. And under the guise of health care, I can show you the monitor. Your kid's blood pressure was accelerated when we talked about homosexuality. Your kid's pupils dilated. Your kid slouched in his seat. What are you doing at home to make your kid anxious about these issues? It's inescapable, the conclusion here. And the most you can say to us is, well, maybe that won't happen. Maybe it won't. But what makes you think it won't? When in the history of the last hundred years? when given latitude has not have not governments taken it. And again, under the guise of sexuality standards, I still don't see sex mentioned here specifically, right? There's touching, right, who, who, you can, who can and can't be touched. Moving a little bit forward, by the end of grade five, define sexual orientation as the romantic attraction of an individual to someone of the same gender or of a different gender. We're leading with same sex, right? As, as the default normal, as somebody, as sexual attraction to somebody of the same gender or a different gender. What right, to the, what right does the federal government have to do this? And remember, under Common Core, you can't go talk to the teacher because she can't do anything. You can't talk to the teacher's principal because he or she can't do anything. You can't go to your state school board. You can't go to your state legislature. Uh, yet another threat posed by Common Core is the absolute appropriation of Soviet ideology and propaganda in the constructing of Common Core and its implementation. This chart that follows this slide is also from um, our, our, the wonderful document promoting grit, tenacity, and perseverance. The chart shows the 21st century competencies. Such competencies as flexibility, adaptability, artistic and cultural appreciation. Down here under leadership, it shows uh, leadership responsibility, assertive communication, self-presentation, under teamwork and collaboration. It, shows that a proficient, some of the proficiencies that they're striving for are collaboration, teamwork, cooperation, coordination, uh, designed to make your student prepared to just be told what to do for his entire life. And if you, if you look specifically at the different branches of this and the collectivist mindset behind it all, it, it's five-year planning, spaced out over a child's entire universe. It's the old Soviet five-year plan, right? It's all, and I like the word. The word itself is a dead giveaway. It's, it's competencies. What does that mean? Is that what you want your kid to get in school? Is that what you want your kid to get from reading experiences, from uh, education in general, competencies? 
I mean, the idea that we associate going to school with a competency, it, it shows you a very marked capitulation on what education is supposed to be. And what are the intellectual, it says intellectual openness. Notice that it is an intellectual development. It's an intellectual openness. We want you to do whatever we, we tell you to do. We don't want you to have a set of right or wrong standards. Um, the adaptability really struck me. After teaching, I'm about to begin my 40th year in education. I spent 36 of those years in the classroom. And very truthfully, when I began teaching in 1974, intellectual meant specific standards. The child will be able to punctuate a sentence. The child will be able to discuss truly intellectual activities. The child will be able to figure a math problem. But even under the new Common Core, if, even if they said three times four was 11, if they were able to explain their reasoning and explain how they came up with their answer really in um, words and oral explanations, and they showed it in the picture, but they just got the final number wrong. We're really more focusing on the how. Uh, we had a, a parent talk with us at a recent meeting. Just last week. And the correct answer to one of the Common Core tests was, uh, I think the problem was as simple as six times seven. And the correct way to answer that was to draw 42 circles. And I think the child was in third, third or fourth grade. And the child wrote 42 for the answer and got it wrong. Because at the lesson was, the mother told us, that math is, you're being too close-minded. We want you to be fluent in math. In other words, we want you to be able to talk about what math is. We want you to be able to explain why math is useful. We are not interested in you being able to do math. It's much less important to get the right answer. That, and the, the word that she used in terms of the way it was explained to her at her school was estimative math. That the purpose of math is to be able to estimate, to be in a ballpark, to be able to have a sense of how math should function. The details of right and wrong answers, they don't matter. As a matter of fact, and you see how fascist this is, by the way? In the guise of being so open-minded, flexible, adaptable, right, without any core, uh, hardcore black and white ideas floating around in your head, that even something like math and science have to be utterly, well, and you think about this too, one of the big things that's going to be factored into this, we haven't even begun to talk about that yet, is the whole environmentalist agenda, the, the uh, Agenda 21 environmental plan from the UN, how kids at remarkably young ages now, and, but this is going on for a long time. You know, when I was a kid in the 70s, I remember this distinctly. In like 1978, I was three or four years old. Four, uh, I was five years old in 1978. And I remember, as young as five years old, when we were learning how to read, I remember that the teachers brought, we spent almost a month on this in class, a, a, a kid-centered story about the coming ice age. And I remember it because it scared me to death. At that age, I had no idea how to process this. But my teachers had convinced me that within a few years, this six mile high sheet of ice was gonna push me and my whole family into the water and we were gonna drown. That's all I remember about it. I remember having nightmares about this. But as young as first and second grade, even in the 70s, now of course, global freezing has become global warming, has us, forget it now, let's just call it climate change. Because the climate's gonna change if you wait long enough, so we can cover everything under the rubric there. But at very young ages, I remember being scared witless about this. And of course, as an adult, the idea that a six-foot glacier tomorrow is going to just push me into the ocean. But, but kids this young are being exposed. And what flexibility means, again, you think about this, we're going to be so open-minded that the only thing we won't tolerate is an opinion. So open-minded that the only thing we will no longer tolerate is a right answer. And that's the really horrifying aspect of this when you get right down to it. How will Common Core affect homeschooling families? This is a, a common... Um, error that I hear talking with homeschool families from all over in my capacity as um, development director for um, Freedom Project Education. The homeschool families have the idea that somehow they're shielding themselves from Common Core. 
the, the opposite is, is the truth. You have the opportunity right now, at least, to opt out of public schooling. And statistically, homeschooling enrollments, obviously not enrollments, but homeschooling joinees are rising at a rate seven to one over public schools, right? So it's a huge movement now. The problem is, is that with all of this tie into Obamacare, with all of this biometric required information, with all of this bullying legislation that's going to be cemented in Common Core, it's going to be awfully difficult for you to keep your kids home and not have to participate in that. And furthermore, the other thing that's going to happen is all the standardized tests are beginning to change to reflect not true and right and answers, not mathematical answers, but mathematical estimation. Young boy already in third grade gets the right answer. Six times seven is 42. He gets marked off for it. The SAT has already conformed its college entrance exam to, already done it, conformed its college entrance exam to co Common Core, even though the first generation of Common Core kids won't be coming through for 10 or 15 years yet. That's because it's already in the schools. And the ACT, is, we, the ACT is on the fence. We're looking into this now. There was reports that they had conformed, and then they said they weren't, so we don't know what's coming. But here's the problem. You homeschool your kids. You teach them how to critical think, read, and write. What happens when they have to go to college? What happens when they have to take the SAT and the ACT? If those are all geared, if all these tests are then geared towards the Common Core system, how can your kids, as smart as they are, pass them? And you can see what's going to happen. Within a few short years of this, what's going to happen? In the same way that Obamacare itself is a Trojan horse for single payer. It is going to be so unwieldy and disastrous that it'll never work with all these exchanges. So by default, oh, let's just do single payer, which the government wanted to begin with, but they knew could never get passed, right? And so this is going to be the same thing here. You're in, in four or five years, the government's going to say, well, look at how well our kids are doing on Common Core, when all they've done for 15 years is have the same rote, repetitive drone lessons dragged, uh, uh, pounded into their heads. They vomit that forth back on the exams. So, but, but they're all doing well. And it's the home, right now, homeschool kids are exceeding public school kids in terms of ACT, SAT scores, in terms of how they do when they get to college, basic competencies, right? They're exceeding all that. But that's going to flip when the standards change. Then the federal government says what? Well, homeschool is failing our kids. Home By our definition, homeschool kids, who very often tend to be religious kids, if not Christian kids, they're the bullies, right? They're the ones who don't seem open to all these alternative sexualities. They're the ones being raised this way. And now their test scores, by comparison to our common core educated kids, are, have gone from this to this all of a sudden. Then the move comes to ban homeschooling. Uh, that, by the way, is one of the other first few things the Nazis did, the banning of homeschool curriculum. You heard about the German couple who came here, uh, big in the news, right? This German couple came to America because they weren't allowed, Christian German couple was not allowed to homeschool their kids in Germany. It was a, a federal, they risked jail time. They emigrated here, they tried to get a um, refugee status so they could stay in this country. We have 11 to 20 million illegals in this country now who we must grant amnesty tomorrow. It's the civil rights thing to do. This one German couple fleeing actual oppression in their own country, they are being deported back. Agencies have now taken their side and are taking it to the Supreme Court, but the Obama administration ordered them deported back to Germany. And here's a little factoid for you. After World War II, the German government stripped all the Nazi laws from the book except one. The one law that, the not, that was a holdover from Nazi Germany today in Germany is the absolutely no homeschooling law. Private schools pub and, and um, public schools that don't accept government funds, I don't know that there's a public school that doesn't, but those schools that don't affect, take any government money are exempt from Common Core, which is the truth at this minute. But we go to the next slide, and we learn that the most immediate threat to homeschool and private school students is the expansion of statewide longitudinal databases, which we have already discussed. And they go on to say that the designers of these systems fully intend for homeschool and private school students to be a part of this massive data collection. And we're, we're going to get into one of the ringleaders, if you will, uh, for this collection uh, when we start talking about the publishers 
that have aligned with the Common Core. This is the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, by the way. It's a, a, a pro bono group of lawyers whose job it is to keep the right for parents to homeschool open. And uh, uh, this thing that they're talking about here is it's pretty serious because this is where the Obamacare stuff comes in. By all means, you have the right to homeschool your kid, but you don't have your, the right to opt out of Obamacare biometrics either. Right? And so your kid may be educated at home, but we're still going to require from you the same sorts of, sorts of biometric information. We're going to require the same, source of, same sorts of reporting uh, analyses that we require the students. This is, for the gov this is for your health, right? Some interesting points that Mary would talk to you about so you can see where the legislation ties in to what's going on in Obamacare. This is another snapshot of the actual Obamacare legislation. And it lists mandated improvements. Some of those are school readiness, school achievement, a reduction in crime, domestic violence, all again open doors for invasion to your home and your students that you are homeschooling. It is amazing how much of the documentation of Obamacare talks about schools. The national health care program and what goes on in school, and it has none of it has a lick to do with education. All the social and bio biometric engineering, all of this data mining and record keeping, it is, it's all throughout that uh, multi-thousand page document that nobody read before it was passed and that we were told, ah, we'll figure it out after we pass it. On this slide, we see a picture of Sir Michael Barber. He is one of the publishers, uh, the leading publisher for school material. Many, many uh, publishers have aligned with Common Core for the, for the money. Uh, we, uh, it's come to our attention that um, Ms., uh, Sir Michael Barber is now trying to take over the education in Canada. It is outlined that this man now has control over what is taught to your children, how your children are tested, and how these test scores are evaluated and the technology that they use. There's a school uh, district in Colorado, a mom wrote and explained that all they had to do was get this particular laptop, type of laptop, but they had to take it to school a few days before because the school had to put a particular program in. And, and it, it so happens that research indicates that the tech, the company that produces this technology is associated with Pearson. And they brag that they record and know every little keystroke, every little everything that goes on on that computer. And they can track the kind of things that you as a mom might get a cell phone so you can keep tab on your kids. They record every move your kids make, every single one of them. The school districts now do this. Already this is going on. And Michael Barber is, is absolutely shameless in his, he tells you what he wants. Look him up. He wants all education in the, he's absolute globalist. He wants all education in the whole world to be the same. There's a big article in the paper today about his move to take over the educational market in Canada. And he's a big player in America. He's a Brit. He is aligned with Common Core. Big, uh, he is one of the, one, he, by the way, he's one of the non-teachers who actually wrote the English reading standards, the reading standards for Common Core, right? Big, uh, big donor to the Obama administration. There are sources on the web for homeschooling parents to check out the status of the publishers for the material they might be choosing. We ourselves here at Freedom Project have found that to be a very difficult task. I recommend that you avail yourself of these services, but I certainly would encourage you to contact the company yourself to be sure that the information is absolutely accurate. Hundreds of publishers have gone over to Common Core because that's where the money is. The federal government decides Common Core what it is what it is. All these publishers, even, even publishers who you would think ideologically would not do this. Bob Jones University Press, a radically fundamental Christian group, right? Um, this school that had absolute bona fides when it comes to standing up to this kind of government intervention, Bob Jones University Press, we found out, has adopted Common Core standards too. Uh, so it, it, but it's a money thing. It's, you, if, you're a t if you're a publisher of textbooks, the, it's the government by far, like 95% of textbooks are government sanctioned. So it's a matter of staying in business, right? It's just like the race to the top money to adopt Common Core. 
bribe, make it so that they have no other, make them an offer they can't refuse. So what do we do? We're wrapping up now. How can we fight this? Well, first of all, you need to educate yourself. You don't have to become an expert. But know what it is, and then take that knowledge that you yourself get and educate others. It is essential. This is a fight for freedom for our children. And you should know that of the four, 46 states originally signed on to this, now states are backing out. George, we'll see what happens. Georgia's interesting. Georgia just last week said, no, we're not going to do it. Just today, the federal government said, then we're taking money back from you. We're taking millions out of your budget. Now we'll see what Georgia does, because that's the ultimate threat, isn't it? That Georgia, they had already budgeted this money for this year. It was there in the bank accounts. That's a big nine, ten million dollars is a huge hit for a school district, for a state school budget. Now that the state said, well, if you're not going to implement it, we're taking this money back. It has been in the news lately that some states are pulling out of the testing consortiums, which we, we talked about which earlier. Which is good news. Florida and my home state of Indiana today pulled out of PARC. Missouri has backed out of Common Core. It can be done. Uh, the, perhaps the best thing about the comparison between Obamacare and Common Core is that um, health care is one of those things that we all deal with on a daily basis. We don't necessarily all deal with education on a daily basis. So now that this is coming out, the groundswell, and, and it's one thing when you're dealing with us, but when you're dealing with people's kids, this becomes a problem. And so people are making differences statewide to statewide, but it has to happen now. A year from now, a year and a half from now, it will be so entrenched in the schools there can be no modifications. Don't be discouraged if you try to talk to teachers about this because I guarantee uh, that they're, they're going to brush you off. Um, teachers have been so used to fads, educational fads, coming and going. And as I have told several people, each of those fads came and went, and, and I'm talking 40 years of, of these. And even though they went, they left a scar. And now teachers who have years of experience and should know better are so scarred and so used to it that A, they're just kind of numb to it. Oh, this is just another thing that'll come and go. They, they do not understand that this is a grab for control. And we talk about a death by a cut, a thousand cuts, right? And we've seen oh, since the 1960s, we've seen that in education, we've seen it in healthcare, the endless regulation, the government interference, all of that implication until you get to a critical mass where the next step is the obvious one. This would be the first time, despite all the things we've told you, all the horror stories of the last 40 years, this would be the first time you'd have absolutely centralized, nationalized uh, uh, education. And that idea, we hear this from a lot of teachers, ah, We've seen these programs come and go. Yeah, but the problem is every time one comes and goes, it leaves you that much farther to the left, right? If you think about how bad No Child Left Behind was, and, right, and where that moved, you couldn't have Common Core had you not had No Child Left Behind, had you not had all of these incredibly failed uh, government-minded educational programs dating back to at least the 1960s. And so now, as with health care, you couldn't have had Obamacare had you not had the Hillary debacle in 97, right? You couldn't have had it. And so we reached the point now where critical mass is there. And the problem is, and, and I'm willing to, willing to defer to any of you, when was, just give me one example in American history where a big government centralized entitlement, this is an entitlement program, isn't it? Right? This, all this, when do they ever go away when you start them? So if you're going to fight them, if you're, if you're minded to fight them, the thing that you can do, and you think the teachers are woefully miseducated about this, your legislators don't have a clue. Ask them to pay attention. Just write them a letter. If you're not even convinced by this yet, if you've got to do your homework, just write a letter and say, hey, do you know what's going on here? I guarantee you most of them won't have the vaguest idea. Um, all they know, I mean, they're politicians. It's all about budgets. And they know they had more money this year than they did last year because the government miraculously gave $30 million to the state of Wisconsin or $50 million to the state of whatever state it is. And that money's there and we're gonna, we need it. But at what price? <laughs>